Welcome everybody joining us online, all of our churches, any of our military, as well as everybody here in Chula Vista. Thank you for being a part of this today. Uh, I believe that God has something specific to you and special for you uh, as a result of you giving him a little bit of space and time in your life today. We're going to jump right in looking at our theme verse for the series. Everybody grab that outline out of your program uh, or click over there on notes if you are on the app. And I want us to read Colossians 1.6 out loud together in our outside voices, all of you out on the patios as well. Here we go. Ready, begin. The same good news that came to you is going out all over the world. It is bearing fruit everywhere by changing lives, just as it changed your lives from the day you first heard and understood the truth about God's wonderful grace. This verse speaks of the ripple effects that happen when the good news, or another name for that that you'll see in Scripture, is the gospel touches our lives. If you're taking old school notes, I want you to underline two little phrases. At the beginning, underline good news. And then at the very end, I would like you to underline God's wonderful grace. So what, what is the good news of Jesus that they're talking about here that, that went out and changed their lives and started changing other people's lives? Well, the good news is simply that Jesus showed up announcing that everyone, regardless of the nation they were born in, could now be a part of the kingdom of God. Jesus showed up announcing that everybody's welcome, everyone's invited, that anybody can get in now, because ultimately Jesus was here to show us God's love and set up God's kingdom. And because Jesus gave his life on the cross... Uh, and ultimately because of his resurrection. Now everybody could be forgiven. And so Jesus showed up saying radical things, that you are more loved by God than you could ever imagine. And nothing you could ever do could change that love. Jesus said that, that God was a good father, which was a radical idea at that time. And so, so the good news gospel is not only are we loved by God, that we can be forgiven by God, but then we are invited into his kingdom work that we all have a divine purpose on our life to play our part in God's redemptive story. This is the good news. This is the gospel. And the amazing thing is that this good news costs us nothing. You can't earn it. You can't get good enough for it. You can't buy it. It can only be received as a free gift, compliments of God's wonderful grace. That's it. And so the gospel, it doesn't cost us anything but it demands everything. It demands that we jump all in. A, a, that's the idea of this, this cannonball, this journey that we're on for two years. It demands that we live a fully surrendered life to God, saying, God, all that I am and all that I have, it's yours. I'm gonna trust you and I'm gonna choose to follow you. And, that, and it's only in that kind of surrender and letting go that we experience the kind of freedom and the faith that Jesus promises. But so many of us never get to this place in our faith journey because we're afraid that if we let go and if we jump all in with Jesus, that somehow we're going to miss out on something. That somehow we're going to miss out on some, some experience or some sort of success or some sort of standard of living. But that fear is just not true. Because the truth is, when we hold on or we hold out from God, we only lose out. It's only in letting go, full surrender, a cannonball of faith that we experience the kind of faith and the kind of life that Jesus promises. Uh, and a, let me explain it this way. Uh, an ancient hunting practice to try to catch monkeys, uh, hunters would use a coconut like this. And uh, this is a well-known uh, method. And what they would do is they would, they would burrow a hole in it about that size, just big enough for a monkey to slip its open hand into it. And they'd put some sort of bait in the bottom, maybe a little piece of fruit. And what the monkey would do is reach in and then grab the fruit, but, but the hole is big enough that a closed fist could not get out. And they would tie the coconut to a tree or a stake in the ground to capture the monkey. 
And those little monkeys were so greedy and so stuck on the prize that they would just keep their hand in their closed fist trying to get it out. And as the hunter approached, and even though the monkey knew I am in danger because now this person is approaching, they would grip that bait or that little piece of fruit all the more and even aggressively try to get their hand out unsuccessful. And ultimately, their greed would lead them to their own capture and ultimate death. All they had to do was let go and they could be free. Stupid monkeys. <laughs> Aren't you glad we're so much more evolved than that now? You see, the, the truth is, I, I think many of us are trapped by things in this life that we are holding on to. And the message of Jesus is that if we would just learn to let go, we could actually finally be free. Uh, for, for some of us, uh, the thing that's maybe trapping us it is a uh, idea or a picture of what real happiness or success is. And, and we're holding on to some image that somebody else has sold us and said, this is what success looks like. Like if you're going to be happy, this is what you need to look like. If you're going to be happy, this is what you need to drive and this is what you need to make and this is what you need to live. And so, so we're trapped by some image in our mind that isn't even reality. And if you could just learn to let go of that, you could actually walk and live in freedom. For others of us, maybe it's our possessions or our money. And we hold on to that so tightly that actually the things we own own us. And so we hold on to that and we think this is what it's about. But what you, if you would just learn to let go and actually learn generosity and learn to share some of what God has blessed you with, you would actually find that freedom and that joy in those resources that you have. For others of us, maybe it's anger that we're holding on to. And we're holding on to what somebody said or what somebody did to us. And we're like, that is my right. I am not letting go, but here's what you know, it has you trapped. You are trapped by that. You got bitterness in your heart. And if you would just learn to let go and forgive, you could actually be free. You see, very often in this life, and especially in our journey with Jesus, we must let go to fully live and find freedom. And this is our big idea today. What we're gonna spend the rest of our time unpacking is this idea, go ahead and write this down. Today's big idea. Freedom is found when we move from holding on to letting go. Real freedom is found, not in holding on, but in actually learning to let go. And I get that this idea is really hard for us because we live in a culture that says not only hold on, but hoard on. There's a $38 billion a year industry called storage units because we have so much stuff we can't even fit them in our house. And so we live in this culture that is built on consumerism and materialism. We live in a material world and you are a material girl. <laughs> a little Madonna reference I slid in there. And sadly, there's a whole generation listening right now that goes, who's Madonna? <laughs> I'm old, that's what that means. Our culture is built on consume and accumulate. And because we live in this culture, the truth is we are all at some level influenced by a culture that says, you need this, your life will be better if you have this, that other thing, it's way too old. You need an upgrade. You don't have enough. You won't be happy without it. Hold on and hoard on. This is the message we hear over and over and over again. But the way of Jesus is almost always upside down to the way of our world. And our world says, hold on, while Jesus almost always says, let go. And in Luke chapter 9, we're going to look at one passage of scripture today where Jesus teaches this. Now, before we read it, I see some of you looking down, eyes up here. Before we read it, let me set up for you kind of the story around Luke 9. Because if you read Luke 9 this week, and I invite you to do that as some homework, it's a great, exciting chapter in the Bible. You should read it is at the beginning of this, Jesus is teaching and thousands of people are following and listening. And, and people weren't planning on hanging out with Jesus that long that day. And it gets to the end of the day and everybody's like hungry and realizes nobody planned for dinner and they're far away from town and nobody can get any food. And so the disciples find a boy that has five loaves of bread and two fish. Some of you have heard this story before. And so this is the same day. 
And so what Jesus does is he takes those five loaves and two fish and he turns it into free fish tacos for everyone. It's, it's an amazing miracle, okay? And so everybody is well-fed and they're like, wow, if we hang out with Jesus, we get free fish tacos. We need to stay with this guy. And it's shortly after that miracle moment where Jesus says the words that we're about to read. And they're not words that you think you would say after something like that. Here's what Jesus said. Then he said to the crowd, if any of you want to be my follower, you must give up your own way. Take up your cross daily and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. Now think about these words that Jesus just said. These aren't like, you know, put on billboard signs to try to win new followers. These kind of words aren't, you know, what you want to put out there if you're trying to like gain some momentum in this Jesus following thing. If you and I were running Jesus PR campaign, we would probably tell him, don't say that right now. Right? Because like, like hey, Jesus, your, you, you know, uh, I mean, success and everything, it's at an all-time high. People couldn't be happier with you right now after the fish taco event. Let, let's maybe put this deny yourself, you know, give up your own way. Let's put this in the fine print. Maybe tell everybody later, don't tell people this right now. But Jesus wants people to know then, and he wants us to know now, that if you're going to follow him, that we all need to realize at some point, really at several points, that it's going to mean giving up our own way. Or if you read this out of the NIV, it would say you have to, Jesus' words would have said, you have to deny yourself. And this is as an unpopular message now as it was then. Hold on. Give up my own way. In a culture that teaches us to indulge ourselves, to give way to every desire that we have, to do what makes us happy. And so Jesus, just to be abundantly clear of what he was saying, he says, hey, you have to give up your own way. And on top of that, you have to take up your cross daily and follow me. What does that mean? Well, in, in this ancient Jewish culture at this time, which they were overthrown and living under Roman rule, this would have made the listeners of these words, their eyes almost you know, bug out of their head. Because a cross to them was not something they wore around their neck or they, they put on top of a building or uh, that they, they put as an ornament in their house. A cross was a device of Roman torture, and it meant death. And very often the Romans would make those that they were torturing in front of everybody else to instill fear in the culture that you don't come against us, they would make them carry their own cross to the place of their death, just like they eventually would Jesus. And so when Jesus says, you have to take up your cross daily and follow me, Jesus is saying, if you are going to follow me, it is going to require that you die, 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 die. Who's in? That's what Jesus was saying. And so all of a sudden people were like, those fish tacos don't taste as good anymore. <laughs> because this is a crazy message. Like Jesus, whoa, hold on a second. Like you're telling me like, like I have to give up my way and I have to die to myself. What Jesus was saying when you have to die daily, he was saying there are going to be times that if you choose to follow me, that your wants and your desires are going to come in conflict with my wants and my desires for you. And in those moments, if you're going to be a Jesus follower, what you need to learn how to do through the power of the Holy Spirit in you is to say no to your wants and yes to my wants. It's that I would daily say no to what James Grogan wants when it comes into conflict with what God wants. That I would say, God, your kingdom come your will be done in me before my kingdom come and my will be done. That's what Jesus is teaching here. This is what he's saying. Following Jesus, it involves this incredible step of surrendering to his lordship, to his authority. It is a radical act of dethroning ourselves, taking ourselves off the throne of our life, and then enthroning Christ as king in our life, this is what it means to follow Jesus. And I get how scary this sounds because it still sounds scary to me. And here's why, because I don't like giving up the final word. I don't like not being in charge. 
And my guess is you're not that different than me. And you see, every time that we try to hold on to our life, and this is what Jesus is saying in that second sentence. In that second sentence, look back at it where he says, if you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. What is he saying? If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. He's saying, if there's ever one of those moments where, where what, what God wants for our life and what we want are opposed to one another, and we say no to God, in a sense, what we're saying is we're saying, yeah, 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 no, Jesus, th- this is my relationship. You're, you're not allowed in this area of my life. Hey, no, God, this is my money. No, God, this is my career. No, God, these are my plans. No, these are my friends. Go away, Jesus. I'm going to hold on to this area of my life because I want to try to get what I want. And Jesus is saying if you live like that, where you're trying to save or preserve or hold on to a part of your life, eventually that very thing that you're holding on to, you are going to lose anyway. And so why don't you, and then he ends that little part, By saying, give up your life, give up your wants for my sake, yield to my way, and then you'll actually save your life. All those things you really want, you will have. Because we don't lose when we let go to God, we only gain. Now, I know not everyone here is a Jesus follower, and I'm so glad that you're here today. If you're a guest or if you're new and you're just checking out this Jesus thing, It's a great place for you to do that. But let me tell you what puts these words of Jesus, whether you believe the Bible or not, uh, what, what makes these words of Jesus jump out in incredible clarity for all of us, Jesus follower or not. There's something that occasionally we all find ourselves at, an event that we find ourselves at, that it's probably the only time in this life that it forces us to think about these things that Jesus says, and and it actually brings the words of Jesus into full clarity. Here's what it is. It's a funeral. It's a memorial service. You sit in a memorial service for someone who had their life on this planet in this moment is over, and these words of Jesus become crystal clear. Because when someone dies and their life is no longer their own, we don't celebrate all the things that most of us have tried to hold on to our whole life. Nobody gets up at a funeral and and talks about, oh man, listen to all the promotions that Phil got, you know, while he was on this earth. Or man, let me show you a picture of the house they finally bought. Like nobody does those things. No one gets up and talks about all the sports teams they played on and the games they went to and the amazing vacations that they went on and all the temporary stuff that consumes most of our lives all the time. When someone's life is over, What we celebrate or what we want to celebrate in those moments are the very things that Jesus says, if you'll let go and follow me, you'll actually have, not only in this life, but in the next. What are those things? Character, integrity, love, generosity, relationships, a life lived for other people and other things, making a difference. We want to be able to get up at the end of someone's life and say things like, wonderful father, great husband, amazing mom, loving daughter, compassionate friend. We want to tell stories about how they they served others and how they impacted lives. And even now that they're gone from this life in this body, in this moment, that the way they lived and the things they did and the way they served and the things that they gave to, look at what is left even though they are gone. That's what we all want for us and that's what we want to say for the people we love. And these are the things that Jesus says, if you'll let me lead, if you'll quit trying to hold on and you'll let go, these are the very things that you will gain now and the things that will last forever. I want to help you understand how important your life is right now and how the choices that you make right now ripple on into eternity forever uh, by using this little, here it is, little illustration right here. Now imagine this rope with me, okay? Now imagine this rope goes on forever. It doesn't. It actually ends in that little box. But just imagine with me that this rope goes on forever. And this rope is your life. And this little green part here is your 60, 70, 90, if you're lucky, that you get on this planet in this body. But the rest of this rope, it represents all of eternity. 
millions and millions and millions of years. Because scripture teaches that you and I are not just a body, that we just don't exist in this little time right here. And then when we take our last breath here, that poom, that's all there is, no, no more of us. Scripture teaches that you are not a self, but you are a soul. And that you are an unceasing spiritual being with a divine destiny in God's great universe. That's who you are. That's who I am. That's who every human being on the planet is. And so what scripture teaches is that when this part of our life, this little bit right here, in this body on this planet is over, that we will live the rest of our lives in eternity. And so, so this, it just goes on and on and on. And what's crazy is that most of us, we only ever think about this right here. This is all we focus on. This is all we think about. This is all we invest in is this little bit right here. And we do. We, we, we do things like, here's, here's the crazy things that we do. We go, you know what? I am going to work like crazy right here in this section. And I'm going to save, save, save so that little bitty part right there is awesome. Right? Like I'm going to be able to travel and not work and eventually they'll be feeding me through a straw, but it, you know, I won't have to work. Somebody else will be feeding me through a straw. It's going to be amazing. Um, it's, it's, we laugh, but this is how we live, right? Or we say, you know what? I, man, it is all about this career, this moment right here, and I'm going to get to the top and I'm going to succeed and I'm going to make it. And so many of us live only for this little section right here and we sacrifice marriages and we sacrifice relationships for our kids and we do all that for some status or some amount of money and we sacrifice a relationship with God and we never th consider all of this right here. This is not all there is. This is not all there is. And Jesus taught this. In the very next verse in Luke chapter 9, I want to show you what Jesus says. Look at verse 25. This is the words of Jesus. This is a great verse for us to read out loud together. And here's what Jesus said. Let's read this out loud. Luke 9, 25, ready to begin. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world, but you are yourself lost or destroyed? In other words, what do you get if, you, if, if in this life, in this little green section right here, you get everything you could have ever want, hoped for, or dreamed of, but you lose out on all of this, is that really worth it? That's what Jesus is saying here. And here's the thing. We get one chance in this little green section here. We get one shot in this life to invest ourselves and our resources in what really matters and what really lasts. And you wanna know what really lasts? There's only two things that last after this moment right here. Two things, people and the kingdom of God. That's it. Those are the only two things that last forever. And so what are you investing your life in? What are you investing your resources in? What are you investing your relationships in? What are you investing your time in? In just right here? Or are you considering and thinking about the ripples that will happen and the life that will go on forever? Here's an evaluation question I want us all to ask ourselves. Go ahead and write this last villain in. Will the choices I'm making now, or I'm sorry, let's see, put it up there. There we go. Will my current choices eventually lead to reward or regret? Will my current choices eventually lead to reward or regret? I don't have time to get into it, but if you read Luke 9 this week, you'll see in verse 26 and 27, Jesus speaks to a moment in time where all of the sudden life as we know it like this will instantly be changed. And that we will step from here into here. And in that moment, and Jesus doesn't just talk about this in Luke 9. He actually talks about it in several places in the scripture. That, that there is this moment of reward. There, there is this ceremony for everyone based on how we lived here. In other words, that how we live here actually affects how we live here for all of eternity. And, and this is what Jesus is saying. And, and so a question for us today is, how are we living right here? Like, are, is the way that we're living going to bring reward or regret? When I look at my time, 
Will I look back and say, man, I'm so glad I watched 7,000 movies. Woo-hoo! I mean, I really used that time well right here. You know, watching Gladiator 12 times, totally worth it. All right? Like, like am I going to look back and say, man, all those extra hours that I spent at work, away from relationships with my family and friends, totally worth it. Is it going to bring reward or it's going to bring regret? Now, listen to me. I, I am not against movies or working hard. If you don't have movie pass, you should. Jesus wants you to have that. You're, it's awesome. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not against those things, but here's, here's all I'm saying. I'm just saying, as I studied and worked on this message this week, I was like, ah, it, it, is the way that James Grogan is spending his time, when I stand before God someday, it, is that going to bring a reward or regret? And it just made me do a little self-evaluation and say, okay, am I investing my time in what lasts forever? Which what lasts forever? People? and the kingdom of God. And so those, those hours investing in volunteering, those hours investing in serving in the church and outside in the community, those, those, those hours spent saying, how, how do I you know, help other people find and follow Jesus? Am I, am I spending my life on those things? How about how I'm spending my money in, in this green section? In, 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 am I spending everything that comes to me in this short moment in time on me? Do I live like everything that comes to me is for me? Or do I say, God, you are blessing me here so that I can invest in your kingdom and create some ripples that last well after I'm gone in this moment into all of eternity? Or how about my relationships? Well, the relationships I'm investing in, the people I'm giving influence into my life, the people I'm intentionally spending time with, will that bring reward or will it bring regret? You see, this Ripple Effect series and our two-year generosity initiative, this Cannonball Generosity Initiative, why are we talking about it all the time? Here's why. Because it's about the rest of the rope. It's about the rest of the rope. We need reminders, all of us do, that this is not all there is. And let's invest ourselves in things that will last forever. I want to introduce you to two of our members. There's so many people in all of our churches that are living this way. Uh, But here's just two that are are living with the rest of the rope in mind. Watch their story. My name is Melanie. This is my husband, Aries. We have three beautiful boys. Avery is six years old. Landon is three years old. And we have Oliver, who's six months old. We moved into the area. We really were looking for a place to... uh, to go to church together. Mm-hmm. And I think naturally, you know, we came across East Lake and our first time coming, I mean, th- that's all it took. Mm-hmm. We've been here since. Well, currently we're involved with the financial ministry here at church. We just wrapped up a session of Financial Peace University. And so we've been doing that for a number of years. We're involved in, in couples groups. Um, I'm involved in a men's group. Mel's involved in a women's group. I feel like we've been learning a lot about just how much we still have left to grow. Uh, We've been here for a while, and we've been tithing for quite a while, but just getting comfortable and knowing that there's still more that we can do. I remember that night being at the Cannonball Commitment Night, and I remember Aries and I praying about the amount that we put on that card. It came during a really crucial time period in our lives because I was pregnant, and I knew I was going to be out of work. I was going to be on maternity leave for a few months, and I thought, how is this going to work? And when we signed that card, I remember thinking, okay, God, I know that our income is going to get lower, but our commitment was getting higher. And I remember praying, I remember tearing and crying and and just lifting it up to God and knowing that He would provide. And months have passed, I'm back at work, and I think about that short time that that I was on leave, and I don't even feel like it really really faced us. You know, I think you can get to a place where you're you're comfortable, um, not just with, with tithing and your finances, but just in your faith, right? You, you're doing the same things, being involved in the same type of groups. Growth is about change, right? Not doing the same things over and over again, but trying new things. And in this case, with our finances, was, was stepping up and giving more. I'd want to encourage you just to remember that everything that we have is all His, that we're just being good stewards of what He's already blessed us with. 
you know, this is something that is much, much bigger than us. We're talking about helping other people grow spiritually and with the relationship with Jesus. I think about the different churches that are going to come out of this, um, the different pastors, the different leaders, the, uh, the people who are going to accept Christ in their lives, and how just doing that, making that one decision, can have a ripple effect. And not just in their lives, but in lives of other people for generations to come. I think about that and I'm, I'm pretty in awe that I could be part of something like that. I mean, Matthew 621 says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And for me, I definitely feel by giving to this initiative, my heart has definitely been with God.